Hello everyone, in today's video we're going to start a brief series, probably about three videos or so, uh, dedicated to operating helicopters. Now helicopters are amazing little pieces of machinery. You know, my very, very early days when I'm like, what am I going to do for a living? Helicopters flying was my first choice. It's exactly what I wanted to do. Now if you're wondering why I thought that as a choice, it's uh, because of this game called Comanche 4, which some of you may have played a few years back. Of course, uh, the helicopters in those games are nothing compared to the helicopters we've got in later games. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first things first, though, when you climb into a helicopter for the first time, the helicopter you select as your, finger quote, training helicopter is really important because helicopters all have a distinct personality to it. For example, this is a French-designed helicopter, which means that the rotor is going to go that way, which means my foot needs to go to the right in order to make this helicopter compensate for the torque. When you operate American helicopters, the rotor spins the other way, which now means I have to push my foot to the left in order to compensate for it. This little tiny subtle difference really makes a difference when you're trying to build up the muscle memory to operate a helicopter. Uh, the other thing I want to say, too, before I get too carried away, is the fact that we're still learning how to fly the helicopters in flight sim. They have a different different personality than those in DCS or X-Plane, especially they're still kind of damped. And I'll show you exactly what I mean about that in a minute. So here we go. Let's take a look at our helicopter real quick. We have uh, three rotor blades. This is not a propeller. Uh, many people say, oh, well, you got a propeller on the top of the helicopter. And it's, it's not a propeller. It's a rotor. That's a short for rotary wing because the entire thing is actually a wing. I don't think we can get a good look at this, but if you zoom in, do you see how it's the exact same shape as uh, most aircraft wings? This would be like a stunt plane wing. But because of that, we're actually manipulating the angle of that wing for the purposes of actually generating lift. So when I increase the collective here, do you see how the entire rotor twists in order to take a bigger chunk out of the air, that's where we're going to be getting our lift from with this particular aircraft. If you actually look in the back too, and this is a very clear to see, notice when I'm pressing the anti-torque pedals, it's changing the pitch of the rotor blades. Actually, this would be propeller blades in the back here. So notice we also have a nice little French drawn in the back in order to uh, kind of protect us and give us a little bit better performance here. Another thing you have to think about with helicopters is the fact that a helicopter is inherently unstable or unstable. Uh, what do I mean by that? If you were to let go of the controls after you finger quote trim a helicopter, Helicopter, the helicopter will slowly go whoa, 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 and freak out and hit the ground. Now, there are these helicopters that have what they call coaxial blades, where you have two mounted, or tandem blades, where you have kind of this sort of arrangement, like you can see with my mouse. But we don't have that, which is actually kind of a shame, because those helicopters are really easy to learn how to fly on. Instead, we're stuck with this. So what else do we have to think about when we're dealing with helicopters? Uh, the next problem, of course, is the fact that since we have a very, very strong torque force this way, the helicopter is going to have a tendency to twist in the opposite direction, especially as we increase the demand for lift on the helicopter itself. That requires a whole separate mechanism, which is our little tail rotor here, that we're going to have to be able to counteract this rotation force with this force. It gets worse. A helicopter's rotor here is also affected by ground effect because it's a wing. You have this thing called rotor in ground effect. And when we get close to the ground, you'll actually find that you get this kind of little cushion of lift that, or not lift, or reduced drag, let's be technical here, that will actually affect the performance of the helicopter. And to make it worse, worse, because you have one of these rotor blades going into the incoming air and one of the blades going away from the air, it actually creates another effect where you get asymmetrical lift from the rotor. Now you put all that together and you realize these things were not really intended to fly. Uh, my favorite joke, of course, is helicopters don't fly. They simply beat the air into submission. I believe that. So today's video is just dedicated on, let's go ahead and take a look at the controls, the general process of getting one of these started, and how to do a quick little hover check so we can make sure everything's working. So let's climb on board. Crunk. Ah, here we go. So the first problem we have with one of these devices, it doesn't matter if it's the Bell 407, it doesn't matter if it's a Chinook, you're always going to have the same basic problem. And that's the fact that your engine is going to have to have some sort of not mechanical connection with the rotor. Uh, the reason being is that rotor has a tremendous amount of inertia. And if we try to crank a starter that also cranks up that giant rotor, we're going to have some issues. There are some very, very advanced gas turbines that could probably make it, but they don't actually have a direct connection generally. So what does that mean for us? Well, let's go through the process here. So I'm going to go come float down here. And the first thing we're going to do, of course, click the master switch here. We're going to pop on the strobe light to let everybody know. And we have this funky switch that says clutch. This helicopter and most helicopters have a clutch. The clutch separates the engine itself from the rotor so that we can start the engine 
and then engage the rotor smoothly. That also helps absorb some funkiness that you're going to get here, kind of a thing as well. We're going to leave that off because we can't start the engine with the rotor connected. One thing I will do is flip on our little car heat real quick. Jumping behind me, I'm just going to confirm that my fuel valve is on. Looks pretty good. Coming down here, I'm just going to flip on my transponder to let everybody know I'm a big scary helicopter. Watch out for me. I'm also going to float above my head here. And again, this is a general thing for all helicopters. The 407 is a little different because it's a gas turbine. We're just a piston engine. Of course, just like an airplane, we're going to flip on the mixture here. We're going to make sure this rotor brake is disengaged. Interestingly enough, we can engage the rotor brake and completely start this thing. The reason we can get away with that is on account of the fact that this particular air helicopter has that clutch feature. The other thing we have, which is really funky, is we have this little engine plasma and we have a magneto to help get everything started up here. It's kind of a neat system. It's basically the same as you could expect. So how do we start a helicopter? Well, the first thing we have to do is this lovely little collective lever. We have to make sure it's all the way down. Remember, the collective is the tool that is going to be controlling the pitch of those rotors, which is going to control our lift. We want to make sure that's disengaged. Now, one thing you'll notice in Flight Sim is if I jam my throttles up and down really fast, do you notice how the collective is delayed? That is an unfortunate Microsoft thing, and I really wish they'd fix it because having flown a little bit of helicopters in my real world as well, is I got to say, they're sensitive, and that ain't sensitive. And uh, you're going to know exactly what I mean when you try it. The other thing you need to know about this lovely collective, which controls our lift, is there's a throttle on the end of the collective. Now in Flight Sim, this is throttle. This is propeller pitch, which I think is almost backwards, but from a practical perspective for those who have joysticks, this works actually fairly well as well. The other thing that makes things even more complicated, let me go float over here, is on this particular helicopter, uh, we actually have the starter switches in the front. Now the starter is going to be engaged separate from the actual rotors, as you'll see in a second. So how does this work? So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and crack it. And again, keep in mind, if you're in a gas turbine, this is a slightly different process. And I'll show that to you when we look at the Bell 407 later. But I crack the throttle just like you do in an airplane. And then we just hit engage. So I'm going to go float up here. Go ahead and set my two magneto switches on. Click, click. Looks pretty good. We should be getting an angry beep. Make sure the uh, clutch is closed and off. And all we do is watch how scientific this is. That's it. <laughs> the engine started. Like it, huh? So if I float down here, I can see my engine RPM here is right around 1,000 RPM. Uh, so I'm actually going to adjust my engine just a teeny bit. You can see if I push the throttle, I can rev up the rear, rear, rear. <laughs> we can go ahead and run it. We're looking for about 1,000 RPM here, which is good. But notice my rotor blade is still because we haven't engaged it yet. So every helicopter's got slightly different personnel. I'm going to flip on the alternator here. Of course, uh, we should probably have the fuel pump switch on. That probably would have been a smart idea. But it's a good helicopter. I'm not worried about it too much today. But the big thing here is now that we have the engine itself engaged, just we need to let everything get warmed up a little tiny bit. And then normally you can see my gas temperature flying up here. Then we come over here and we'd engage the clutch. So this makes the world's scariest sound. Oh my god, it's like death. So what's happening now is you probably observe my rotor starting to spin up and my little tail rotor is also starting to spin up together. Now, one important concept here is that collective, you want to make sure it's nice and down to not create excess load on it. Now, if you see it starting to stall, what I can actually do is I can actually push the throttle forward a little bit to basically kind of help it along so that it engages a little bit quicker here. Now, if you get issues where the engine stalls out completely, like we have here, we can always come down here, pull off that clutch and disengage it so that the helicopter will slow down, allowing us to re-engage our engine for whatever purpose. Like I say, and unfortunately, because of the way these are engineered, you're always going to be running into problems where you could actually kill the engine on startup, which is a very, very common thing. And I thought I'd show you exactly what that looks like so you can get a feel for it. All right, engine's re-engaged. Now we can go back to the clutch, re-engage the clutch, cover that sucker up. We're just going to give it just a little bit more power here to try to kind of catch it. There we go. So you can see now that the engine's starting to catch up a little bit of RPM, and we can see that the rotor blade is starting to synchronize with it. Like I said, little things that you're going to have to be fighting the whole time. So what we want to do now is we want to go ahead and get this running at a pretty smooth RPM, nothing too, too excessive here. So I'm going to get it going a little bit, and then we're going to engage something called the governor. The governor is on all helicopters, and what it does is it allows the engine to dictate the throttle setting, so we don't have to adjust it as we're flying. We can manually control the throttle on a helicopter, but when you do that, you're going to make yourself slightly in insane because you're going to be constantly adjusting the throttle. Notice, by the way, the throttle handle is built into the collective so that we can make these little micro adjustments if we had to, if there's an emergency. But this little governor that I just flipped on will do that for us automatically. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to smoothly apply power here, and we're going to get our rotor up to the speed. Notice, by the way, that rotor is moving pretty quick above our heads. It's about 450 RPM. And I'm going to now let the governor take over. So watch what happens. 
All right, did you see how the power adjusted itself automatically? And do you see how my RPM here is tweaking? If you actually look, do you see how the throttle itself is now moving itself? It's because the engine, as the rotor bites more into the air, is going to require more power. So it automatically goes ahead and sets you up so that you can have the correct amount of power on demand. Now, if you're in a gas turbine helicopter, that process is a little slow. So you have to kind of predict when you're going to need a power change. So right now, just to turn that giant rotor above our heads, we're using 27% of our power, and that rotor is turning at 530 RPM. Now, incredibly enough, like I said, if you look down here, if I were to increase the collective a little bit, what will happen is you'll actually watch the throttle start to twist itself into position so that it starts to grab it. Now notice, even though I increased my collective here, it did not cause us to go up. That's because, uh, just because we're producing uh, quite a bit of a thrust and lift here, is that we're not actually going to move anywhere. So after you got this thing started up and everything's ready, remember these types of helicopters are typically like carbureted in this particular version, so we want to make sure everything has some time to kind of get going here and kind of warmed up and cooled off and everything. We also have to think about carburetor heat, but again, that's for another day, so I'm not stressing about that too much. The next step we would do with a typical helicopter after, you know, getting our radios and our frequencies is we do what they call a hover check. Now, a hover check is uh, where we're going to leave off today because we've gotten a you know, pretty good amount of information already. So what a hover check is, is just a way to determine is the helicopter producing the correct amount of lift based on the conditions. Now, we don't have a hover check chart here, which is actually kind of disappointing because if we did, we could actually look it up just a little bit. I love how there's a fuel adjustment for automotive gasoline. What a cool helicopter this thing is. But the, what we're going to do is we're going to smoothly apply collective power until the helicopter starts to get light on the skids. So I've got myself at about 50% power. Notice by the way that the blue line is demand and the white line is current. So right now I'm basically asking for 60 power here and it's giving me about 50% overall. Remember obviously we can't go into the yellow, bad things happen. As you start to build that lift, you'll notice if I move my controls away, you see how everything in the helicopter starts to go? You can actually be very dangerous, and I can actually tip my cyclic, which is uh, going to be that control like this, and I can actually get the helicopter to go up on one skid. Uh, please don't do this. Uh, this is how you die in a helicopter. Uh, helicopters have something called a dynamic tip point, that once you hit that point, the helicopter's going over no matter what. So now that our controls are light, we're not actually going up, but we actually do have enough control here that we could potentially put us in a lot of danger. So you want to be very, very cautious with it once you start to back it up. So what we're going to do is we're going to continue to increase collective uh, smoothly. And what's going to happen is the helicopter is going to start getting very loose. Now, this is where people get in trouble immediately. So with our helicopter, and remember, I have to push right foot to compensate for the twist of the rotor right now. As a matter of fact, you notice I push the right, the left, uh, right foot, the helicopter starts to lift off the ground. The second thing we have to do is we have to remember that we're not going to be producing that thrust straight through the center of us. So not only do I have to apply right right foot as we start to come off the ground and start to unstick, but I'm actually going to have to take my controller and I'm going to have to tip it to the right to compensate for the helicopter's tendency. See how light it is on the road skids right now? That's okay. Again, do this gently, especially when you're first getting the hang of it, because the first couple are going to put you in a really bad spot. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to keep smoothly applying a, 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 a torque here. I'm sorry, collective. Let's be technical. And we're starting to get real light. So what I'm going to do is what they call the J. So normally what we do is we pull that just a teeny tiny bit, and we want to put that to the right. And that should be more than enough to get our helicopter stable. Now, do you see how it keeps trying to come up on its own? We are at the dynamic lift point here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply one more collective and now we're free of the ground. So today our hover power for this particular condition is going to be right around 63 to 65 percent power. So now what we're going to do is we're going to smoothly reduce that and we're going to come back on the ground. The important thing now is if I look down at my controls I know exactly how far my right foot has to be and I know exactly how far this has to be so that when we finally do unstick from the ground we have the ability to safely climb upwards. And again we'll just go right back up to find that point. We determined it was about 65 percent so it's about 60 we're going to start getting real light see how the whole helicopter wants to twist to the left again we want to do this smoothly as possible there's 63 64 65 it's not unsticking give it just a couple more oh see how it's starting to get light and there it goes now we have our aircraft our helicopter I should say which is an aircraft airborne we're just going to go settle right back down in the skids Practice finding that point in your early point of your helicopter, and it'll make it a little bit easier for you when you're moving to the next step. But other than that, enjoy.